So every now and again I do something like this with this handout and um, it just seems particularly helpful in my own mind I guess as I try to think about um, what happens in this chapter and trying to kind of keep some of it straight. Um, seems to me there's some helpful insights to be gained by doing something like this on this text. <clears throat> Before I actually start the message or anything, let me just say a couple things about the chart here. Um, just the, the whole title of the whole chart, Speech in Genesis 17. Um, and I have three uh, columns there, the narrator's speech, God's speech, and Abraham's speech. Um, then just some other things, some important words are highlighted. Covenant is highlighted, uh, is used 13 times. Circumcised is used 10 times. Um, and then in gray, in a light gray, I have just sometimes some clarifying notes, some things to kind of help you think through things as they go. And then in highlighted in red or marked in red, I have just some, what I think are some important statements um, just kind of throughout there that sort of characterize some things um, that will be helpful to us. Well, that makes sense, clear enough, as far as what we're, there's kind of a, the more I wanted to do on here, the more busier, it, you know, the, or the busier it got, and then I kind of had to pull back and say some things. There was another, next time I speak, uh, I, well, I'll, I'll be speaking uh, next week at Brashears. I'm, I'm not sure if yet if I'm going to teach on Genesis, then if so, I'll have another handout then, which I didn't have this time because I was planning on this being one sheet front and back. So I'm going to save the second sheet with other information on it for next time. But I ended up with two sheets anyway. But anyway, that's what happens. So um, that's, the, that's the plan. So you may get another, another sheet on Genesis 17 um, next time, or relevant to our discussion on Genesis 17. Everybody settled? We all here and ready to go? Why don't we pray? and seek the Lord's help for our time here. Heavenly Father, we ask of you that you would take this word, your holy word, and use it among us today for holy purposes. You would produce in us holy affections, holy thoughts, and holy lives. Lord, we confess a love for you and a desire that uh, you'd meet with us now and help us in, in every way to give attention to your word and to Take from it all that you have for us. That the things to be brought out here today wouldn't land on us uh, lightly and with a degree of insignificance, but um, we would begin to understand something of why these events were recorded for us and their importance and how they are meant to teach us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, um, let me just review very briefly and kind of introduce the message for today. The last time I spoke, we considered the 13-year gap that exists in between two chapters in Genesis, Genesis 16 and Genesis 17. If you're not in your Bibles, I know you have this sheet in front of you that has all of Genesis 17 on it, but if you would turn to Genesis 17, 16 and 17, and look at the end of verse, uh, the end of chapter 16, verse 16 says, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And then the very next verse, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, it goes on. So we have a 13 year gap 
And essentially, we considered what changes would have happened during those years. Um, that's a dangerous thing when we start to say, well, I wonder what would have happened there, and you start to speak about it. But um, we can confidently say a number of things because when you look at the way Genesis, things are described in Genesis 16, and then later on in the story, you kind of see the way these same people are reacting to one another and the way the situation is set up and how it's different, you can see those changes must have happened in those 13 years. There's just no other time for them to have happened. And that was significant because it's, it uh, shows us that the 13 years were not wasted. God didn't put Abraham or Abram on a shelf and forget about him, you know, and 13 years later realize, oh, wait, I forgot. I, was, I, was, I had something to do over here I wasn't yet done with. That's not the way it is. Um, we saw that in the 13 years, Hagar's role in the house has changed. She's no longer the slave woman, woman of Sarai, but is Abraham's slave woman. That's said that way later in uh, Genesis 21. Um, it appears that Sarai could not bear the close and intimate nature of she and Hagar's previous mistress-servant relationship. Uh, while Sarai had softened toward Hagar and toward Ishmael, um, and that was good, but to have Hagar serve her in such an intimate capacity was just too much. She was allowed to stay, she was welcome to stay, but not in the same capacity. We saw that Hagar did not seem to enjoy any special relationship with Abraham. Even though her son became greatly loved and greatly cherished by Abraham, Hagar was just that, that slave woman. So it's, a very, it's an interesting situation. It's an unusual one. It's one I think all of us are glad we don't have to face. We also saw that Abraham grew in his concern for personal righteousness, for treating others in a righteous way, even if it meant uh, it cost him personally. Um, you remember in Genesis 16, as soon as Hagar was a source of strife between he and Sarai, Abram wanted nothing to do with it and didn't really much care how Hagar was treated. But later in Genesis 21, when... Um, Sarah wants to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Abraham is not too keen on the idea. Not because of his great love for Hagar or anything, but because he, he just it didn't feel like it would be right. It was displeasing to the Lord the last time he listened to her. He's concerned it may not be right this time. But Sarah's, Sarah's attitude is so changed about it that she's at the place now where she can say those kinds of things and not have a wrong heart about it. So lots of changes have happened. Also, Abraham, Abraham had spent these 13 years believing that God was in the process of fulfilling his promises to him and fulfilling the covenant that he had made to him in Genesis 15. I mean, God made that covenant after a big number of years. Finally then, you know, about roughly 10 years later, he's got this son, Ishmael, and he's glad to have him. He's thankful for him. And for 13 years, he's believing that this is the child that God has given him. As mixed as the, some of these, the promise of God and the prophecy about Ishmael might be, there's enough overlap there that he's confident that Ishmael is the one. And he's been pouring into Ishmael faithfully, loving him as a father. This is what he wants. He's happy with his boy. He's thank, I, I imagine there's not a day that goes by that Abraham doesn't wake up and thank God for this child. He's grateful. Full of faith, you might say. Right? Misunderstood, but he has an attitude of believing God. He's not doubting God in any way. Now, there had been many failures in Genesis 16, but by the time we get to Genesis 17, there have been 13 years of routine, day-to-day -day living. Just humdrum, same old kind of thing. Same people, you wake up, see the same faces every day. This is the way it was. Thir but 13 years, not just of routine, but daily lessons in character, in godliness, and in enduring faith. 13 years. I mean, if God would have had, ha God had Hagar come back if for no other reason than just the maturing of personal righteousness and godliness that would have been necessary for them to make that work. So it's quite a thing. 
Now also, last time I spoke, I dropped this big hint about the message today, and that was from Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. I didn't mention the text last time, but if you would turn to Romans chapter 4 and verse 11, I want to remind you of this, and it will set you in the right direction as we begin today. Romans 4.11. This is the Apostle Paul speaking about the events that happen in Genesis 17. And he says that he, that is, this is Romans 4.11, he is speaking of Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. There are two huge things that are answered for us about this covenant of circumcision in this text by Paul. And we are not allowed to deviate or to give a different answer than what Paul gives when we explain the covenant of circumcision. Because this is the inspired answer. What, does, what did circumcision signify? Paul says it signified, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteous that he, righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So whatever we understand about circumcision and what it signified, we've got to come down where we can make it fit with when Paul says, it was a seal about, to him about the righteousness that he already had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Right? It was a, God put a seal upon him. This man's righteous in my eyes. That's my guy. It's got to somehow relate to that. And also, what was the reason God gave this sign of circumcision? What was the reason for God saying these things? Verse 11 the purpose was to make him... You see, there was a reason God gave the sign. So both the meaning and the purpose, or the significance and the purpose, both given there by Paul, was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had, before he was circumcised. The purpose was not to bring circumcision to lots of people. The purpose was to bring righteousness to lots of people. Circumcised or uncircumcised, that wasn't the, the point wasn't circumcision. The point was what circumcision would lead to. That it would result in people who are circumcised and, uncir and uncircumcised having the righteousness that Abraham has by faith. Whether circumcised or not, that was the purpose for which God gave circumcision. And that seems, seems strange. Right? I'm going to give you this thing and command you to do it, and it doesn't really matter to me. The reason I'm doing it is so that this other thing that you already have can come to lots of other people. It's an instrument. It's a stepping stone, according to Paul, in giving righteousness to lots of people. Circumcision for Abraham and circumcision for the people of Israel is a stepping stone so that righteousness would come to people whether they're circumcised or not. That's, so I've got I've to understand those things. Whatever else we get out of Genesis 17, we've got to land here and agree with Paul that that's how circumcision worked and the purpose for which God gave it. So that's where we're going. <coughs> Today then, I want us to consider this covenant of circumcision. I want us to consider this the significance and the meaning of circumcision. And that's the title of the message, The Meaning of the Covenant of Circumcision. The Meaning of the Covenant of Circumcision. Now in one sense, and you parents have been forewarned, this message involves us in some uncomfortable physical discussion. Very minimal, but it's there, right? In another sense, this message involves us in some very significant and important material in understanding the Bible as a whole. Like we've got to, you can't just... Because God used circumcision as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, and then later the sign of the Mosaic covenant, 
And because the New Testament deals with it so much because of that, you can't understand your Bible if you don't have some understanding of the purpose and the meaning of circumcision. You're just going to, there's lots of pages in the Bible you're just going to say, I don't know what they're talking about. Because you don't have any idea about this thing. So we can't just avoid it if we're going to be uh, mature Christians. We have to come to an understanding of this issue. So the message today will have several parts. Um, first, I want to give a couple of definitions at the outset so that we're clear. Second, I have this handout for you that puts all of the verses in Genesis 17 into three categories of speech. Again, speech made by the narrator, by God, and by Abraham. We'll go over that and consider some important features that we find there. Third, we'll consider the meaning of circumcision from a few passages in the Old Testament. And then we'll consider some things that the New Testament has to say about circumcision. So that's, that's the, roughly the outline there. So then, um, first thing, definitions. Um, I say we're talking about the meaning of the covenant of circumcision. I trust I don't have to, when I think about that title, I don't have to explain the definition of meaning, right? Meaning. So covenant, the meaning of the covenant of circumcision. What do we mean covenant? A covenant, um, most of you are very familiar, is just a binding agreement between two or maybe more parties. Uh, there are different kinds of covenants. But you can think of, you know, we sign, some of your uh, legal documents, even today, will still have the term covenant used in it, right? When you think about when people marry together, they make a covenant one with another, right? When you buy a house, the bank asks you to sign a covenant. We, now we think about a contract, right? It's the same kind of thing. Um, but they weren't all, they didn't all used to be written by fancy lawyers and you know, have 30 pages to them. They just was a handshake and an agreement and a bond and a covenant. Now, covenants, though, um, especially in the ancient world, had a certain kind of form to them. They, had a, they usually took a certain, a, a certain form. They were uh, like a ceremony or things where these things were enacted. But uh, again, there are different kinds of covenants. Two equal parties might make a covenant with one another. Um, that would be one kind. We have two equal parties. You might think of Abraham and Abimelech. They make a covenant of over, a, over a well later in Genesis. And they're just two equals in that sense. Um, or you might have a weaker or less respected person might go to someone else uh, and seek an agreement, ask for things to be a certain way, and ask for an, a, co a covenant. Or you might have a stronger, more respected person like a king might seek to make a covenant with those that he rules. Listen, I'm, you guys you know, have kind of set me up as your leader, and, and that's fine, but if I'm going to rule, it needs to be a certain way. We need to agree to this, these terms. This is how it's going to be. That may happen. Or um, you might have a conquering king might establish a covenant with those that he's defeated. Right? I've taken you all, and now this is how it's going to be or else. Right? That may happen. That happens all the time, right? Some invading army comes in, conquers a land, and says, okay, now from now on you owe us 50% of your crops or you'll die. We'll come in here again. You don't want to, we're going to come here next year armed and you're either going to have the food or you're going to pay for, with your life. But if you do that, anybody else attacks you, I'll protect you, me and my army. What do you think? They're like, kind of, it's kind of hard to, you can't, it's a deal you can't refuse, right? <laughs> Um, it's unfortunate, but you can't refuse. And this is the way it is. You, covenants can take all different kinds of forms. Just because you make a covenant with people don't mean, doesn't mean you're partners or you're in it together. It might mean the king is saying, you'll live by these conditions and that's how it's going to be. Sometimes covenants are made that way. One party just comes in and says, this is how it is. Take it or leave it. Now, um, a covenant might stipulate that anyone who breaks the agreement is subject to death. It might say that anyone who's subject, who breaks it is subject to some other form of penalty. There's all kinds of things, and we have that in our own contracts. If you know, such and such party violates, then this is, the, this is what happens. Um, the covenant does not have to be fair, does not have to be equal to both sides. Um, it is simply agreed to by both parties, or it's put into place as a requirement, perhaps by the greater side, 
Think of international treaties, right? I mean, we had, you know, World War II. We dropped those bombs on Japan, and what did we get from them? Unconditional surrender, which means we went up there and we signed a bunch of papers. We made a covenant with them where we laid down all the conditions, and they just agreed. That was just the way it was going to be. It's, this is what it was. But covenants usually involved, back then especially, a sign of some sort. You might build an altar there, or you might make a payment. You have Abraham there where he makes certain payments. Says, this, these animals will be a sign in front of everyone. This is what's going on. And the, usually in these covenants, there's some sort of a sign, especially uh, with kings and things. The king might set up a statue in this town where he, where he, is, uh, where he rules. It might be some other form of thing, but there's some sort of sign about the people's allegiance to the king or the agreement between the two parties. Whatever, there's some kind of a sign. Now, <coughs> that's all I want to say now about covenant. Now, circumcision. Simply and carefully defined, circumcision is a specific way of marking a man's body or a boy's body by cutting a part of his body which is very painful at the time and very significant in its meaning. It is a way of cutting away a part of the body which can signify any number of things, depending on the reasons for doing it. And I would just ask the kids especially to listen carefully here. Just as today, people will get earrings for different reasons. Uh, sometimes the ear piercing is done to please someone else. Sometimes it's to make a statement to other people. Sometimes just to enjoy it themselves. Uh, you, you might think of a tattoo, right? Certain gangs, maybe. This is maybe closer, closer to what we have here. Certain gangs require their members to have specific tattoos as part of belonging to the gang. Without the tattoo, no matter what you say, you're considered uncommitted and therefore unassociated with the gang. You have to have that mark. So also with circumcision. It was always an important and very significant issue but for different reasons in different places. Circumcision was always important, but some cultures meant this by it, other cultures meant this other thing by it. As, but as far as the thing itself, the actual circumcision itself, again, it was a specific way of marking a man's body, very personal, very painful, very meaningful. But unlike a tattoo or an ear piercing, however, Circumcision is not the sort of thing that you notice on someone walking down the street, which makes it even more deeply personal. It's between you and those that performed it, or those that knew about it, or those that had it done to you, or for those for which you did it. It's just a very personal thing. It's not like putting a tattoo you know, on your neck so that everyone who walks by sees this thing. People don't see it. It was a mark on part of the body that we usually keep covered and private. And so this is what we mean. So this is circumcision. Now, I'm not going to say any more about it in terms of what it actually is. Again, as I said, kids ask your parents. Parents talk to your kids. Now, um, <laughs> this handout we have. Let's consider then the text. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So just at the outset, this is the first, not the first time God has come to Abram and said, this is who I am. But it's the first time he's described himself this way. I am God Almighty. So right at the outset, he's like the greatest possible king or being there is. There's clear lines of authority here. He announces himself as the greatest being possible. I am God Almighty. And then he gives to Abraham maybe the greatest command he could give him. Walk before me and be blameless. And we'll consider that in a little bit. <coughs> Walk before me and be blameless. For the purpose that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. 
Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. So here's my, here's my agreement. Here's my covenant. I want to make this covenant. Here's my covenant. It's with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, so here's God. He says, look, I'm, going to, I'm God Almighty. I'm going to make my covenant. My covenant is with you. And let me tell you from now on, I'm going to change your name. Part of our agreement, you have a new name. You can't go by your old name anymore. You have a new name because I said so. This is amazing. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. So my, he says, my covenant is with you, but it's going to be established with you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. What's he going to do? To be God to you and to your offspring after you. I'll be your God. And I'll be their God. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. As for you, what's your requirements? This is what God's saying. This is all the things I'm going to do. And now, now you, what are you going to do? You shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep. What is this covenant you've got to keep between me and you and your offspring after you? Here it is. What's, what's God going to do? God's going to be God to you. He's going to give you the land. He's changing your name. You've got a new identity. And He wants you to walk before Him and be blameless. And in that context, He's making this covenant. And here He says then, here's what you're going to do. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who was born in your house and he who was bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. And so, in this way, shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. This has to go on forever. This is the covenant that I'm requiring. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, like what happens if I don't do it? What happens? Shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Changes her name too. And I will bless her, and moreover, I will... Uh, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said then to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So Abraham doesn't like the idea. He doesn't want it. No. I've got Ishmael. And God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you. He's already changed her name, right? God says, <laughs> it's like he's not going back. You're gonna, Sarah, you're going to call her Sarah, and she's going to have a child. Abraham says, no. I, what about Ishmael? Let Ishmael live. And God says, no. Sarah is going to have this child. He's going to bear you a son, and you shall call his name. Now we're naming the child. You shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, with him, as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So the covenant, this covenant of circumcision that I'm making, it's not, it's not going to be established and passed down through Ishmael, but through Isaac, right? So this covenant's not for Ishmael. It's for you, Abraham, 
And it is for who else? Isaac. And then for his descendants. That's who the covenant is for. But how do you keep the covenant? You and all the males in your household have to be circumcised. So even though Ishmael doesn't, is not, this covenant's not for him, it's for Abraham and he's in Abraham's house. So he gets circumcised. Now, when he had finished talking with him, when God had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from Abraham. He just left. He spoke. He said, look, no, look, this is what's going to happen. He says, um, again, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And he's out of there. And there's Abraham just left, right, thinking. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house, or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Just right away. Now, I want you to notice some things. There were some of these words I had highlighted in red. Um, most of them portray to the authoritative way in which God sets up this covenant. I am God, you notice, look at the, on the second page here, I have this uh, explanatory note in the middle column. Note the way God is portrayed as a superior king or ruler. Consider his introductory title, God Almighty. His setting of the terms of the covenant. It's just unilateral. This is, the, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what you're going to do. That's the covenant, and it's got to be that way all the time, and if anybody who doesn't do it, they're going to be cut off. Abraham wants to argue for it. He says no. Right? He argues with Abraham about changing anything, and then he leaves. He renames these other parties of the covenant. He gives Abraham a new name. He gives Sarah a new name. He gives Isaac a name. He dominates the speeches. He speaks five times. And then he suddenly leaves. Like he owns the room. <laughs> it's incredible. This is that kind of covenant. It's a covenant where the king comes in and says, this is how it's going to be, just so you know. And that's, that's how it's going to be. And you can take it or leave it. But if you're going to be with the king, that's the condition. So, quite a thing. Now, <coughs> these are not, we might say this way, these are not the covenant conditions Abram would have chosen. The circumcision for Abram isn't a cultural reality. He was a 99 years old, had managed to escape it so far, like, he hadn't been around this stuff, right? There was no circumcision. He didn't grow up, you know, out in, uh, in, uh, in Ur of the Chaldeans and in Haran. He wasn't there, and they weren't all being circumcised. They didn't do this to their kids and to their family and to their anybody. They didn't do that. That was not something they had done. It wasn't the child he would have chosen. He wanted Ishmael. God said no. I mean, all of, everything about this, it's like Abraham is not ready for this. It's not really wanting this to happen. And God says, this is how it's going to be. What a thing. It comes from God. It's not an, a, an agreement. There weren't some ideas from God and some ideas from Abraham, and they kind of worked on this thing and ironed out an agreement how they're going to go forward. Both parties can made some compromises, you know, and they can work, out, work together this way. That's not it. God just showed up one day and said, oh, just so you know, from now on it's going to be this way. <laughs> and I know you love Ishmael, but I'm, it's not the one I've chosen. So get ready for some changes. Next year it's going to be totally different. What a thing. Now, there's this phrase at the beginning, walk before me and be blameless. Now, blameless is pretty clear to us, right? I mean, live righteously, live pure, live godly. We know what blamelessness means, right? I mean, 
You're in a relationship with somebody and can they say anything against you? Have you, have you failed them in some way? God says, walk before me and be blameless. God wants Abram. He means, he's sitting here telling Abram, look, you've really screwed up sometimes in the past and that's not going to be that way anymore. Look, if this thing is going to happen, you need to, you need to be blameless. You need to be blameless. That I may make my covenant between me and you. I'm not looking to make this covenant between, with someone who's just kind of halfway serious about following me, halfway serious about living righteously. You've got to be the most righteous man that you know, Abram. You've got to be blameless that I can make this covenant between me and you and multi may multiply you greatly. What else? Walk before me, he says. Walk before me and be blameless. Now that's a little bit different. I want to turn to three texts real quick just to kind of get a sense of this walk before me and what we mean. Um, they're all here in the Old Testament, uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Kings. Let's turn first to 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, <coughs> verses 22 through 26. And there are other places we could look at for this really similar wording and uh, events here, but 1 Kings 8, 22 through 26. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hand toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant, there's that word again, and showing steadfast love to your servants, who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, whom you have promised, or what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack, lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. Then the other text on this, 2 Kings chapter 20, and verse 3, speaking of Hezekiah here. Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. We'll stop there. It has to do, at least from these two texts, we see with the person's character, their manner of life, their awareness of God, right? The earnestness with which they live under God. Those kinds of things, their character, their manner of life, and awareness of God. You might say, if, if blamelessness has to do with right conduct, proper things you should do, you might say, walking before God has to do with godliness, doing it all with vertical motives, living in the world with a vertical orientation, thinking about God in the world and, and, and belonging to God in the actions that you perform and in the life that you lived. And then in 1 Samuel... To add one more idea here, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. This is the, case, the, the place where the Lord rejects Eli and his house from being priests before him. And he says in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised in the past, right, that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever or should walk before me forever. Promise that. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house. So this is a text somewhat familiar to all of us because of a series of messages Stan had done in the past. But um, the point being here is that going in and out or walking before the Lord here has to do with their priestly service. God had established them to be the ones who stood between the people and God, stood these priests. 
And they were the ones going in and out before the Lord. And there's a sense in which this walking before the Lord has to do with not just for, for, uh, between us and God having a, God, a consciousness of God in all that we do, but also an awareness that we, rep- in a way, because we bear God's name, we represent God to other people. Both things are involved. When we walk before the Lord, walk before me and be blameless. God is calling him to something not too different from what he said in Genesis chapter 12. Be a blessing. Right? Leave all your false idols and come out here and follow me into this land and cast yourself on me and seek to be a ble- and I'll provide for you and you seek to be a blessing in what I do. All the things that I provide are you seek to be a blessing to others in the things I teach you and provide for you. This is not fundamentally different than that. Walk before me and be blameless. Learn the lessons I've taught you. Walk in the righteousness which you've learned. And live it out in the world aware both of your relationship to me and of the need other people have to see the truth about me and your actions. So, Walk before me and be blameless. Now, notice also, again, the extent of the sign that God required. It was required for the man Abram, or Abraham now, but also for his children and for every male in his house. And this was to be practiced this way throughout their generations. Right, it was required not only for one person, but for all. It was a sign of absolute devotion and consecration to God. Why is it <coughs> that all the men under Abraham's authority had to be circumcised? Because they all belonged to him. They didn't just work for him. They belonged to him. They were his slaves and his children. Right? So they all had to be circumcised. Nothing that he possessed was allowed to exist under his control, and outside of being devoted to God in this way, of belonging to God. Right? Everything had to be given to the Lord. Every bit of it. It was a sign of absolute devotion and consecration to God. Circumcising your children eight days after they're born results in the kind of nation that God desired where the entire, you can call the whole nation a nation of priests. They all belong to God. They all bear the mark of a covenant made with God and the descendants of Abraham. And, some, and this results in the eventual fulfillment of God's promised blessing. Now, the meaning or the significance of circumcision. So that's just looking at the handout, some of the things that are there. There's other things that are on there that you can look at that can be helpful for you. Um, And we may come back to this in later messages. But um, the meaning of circumcision. What's the, the, the significance of this? Many Christians have had lots and lots and lots of ideas about the meaning of circumcision. And um, what it could signify. And why would God have chosen this sign? Right? I mean... It's peculiar, a little bit. It's not unusual in in one sense. but Now, I believe that many Christians have been misinformed by a poor reading of Scripture and by other people who have passed on bad assumptions and ideas. Some have said that the purpose of circumcision for, for Abraham and for Israel, the reason God gave it to them, was an act of hygiene, meant to result in greater physical cleanliness. And therefore, maybe it somehow symbolized the purity that God required to have a relationship with him. Like if you've got a, this is a way somehow to have better hygiene. And so that, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, you know. <laughs> but you do have, it's not totally off base in that you, you have texts in Scripture where the priests, if they had some issue, some physical problem, some ailment, they couldn't perform their duties as priests. Right? If you're an Israelite, and you get leprosy, you get to get out of there. You don't get to live among the people anymore. What were all those things signifying? Well, we would say those kinds of things signified something about 
the purity of heart that God required for a relationship with Him. So some people just say, well, circumcision, we know today, has some hygienic benefits, and so that's probably, it was the same thing then. That's what it was, that was the meaning of it. That was the purpose of it. But that's not what Paul says. And that's not what anybody in the ancient world says. So we strike out on that kind of an answer. So it just doesn't work. Now, um, some have said that it was a way of reducing the sexual urges and feelings of men, and therefore God required it as a way of more easily securing people devoted to Him and His service and less likely to practice sexual deviance. And you find all kinds of uh, rabbinic writers um, from like, that I found, like from around 600 or so up to like, you know, 1500s and later, saying that. You don't find anybody prior saying that necessarily, but you can see, I don't know, an argument, I guess, you could be made for that. But some have said all manner of things. Those are the two most common and then some kind of variation of those. People have said all manner of things about circumcision and its meaning. But to get at the meaning, what I see clearly here in the text and in the scriptures, I think it might be helpful just to ask a little bit about historical practice. Back in the ancient world, what was done? Well, most of us, we read our Bibles, especially in the New Testament, and it seems to be that there's only one people in the world who were circumcised, the Jews and those who listened to the Jews, right? And they're like, that's it. But it wasn't that way. Um, it was that way largely in the Roman world of the New Testament time period. But it wasn't that way prior to that and leading up to that. And it's not that way 100% in the world today. <coughs> um, it would be helpful to know that in the ancient world, some cultures did not practice circumcision at all, while some others did. Um, remember, Abraham himself was 99 years old and had not been circumcised. He had lived in some of the population centers of the world. No circumcision. His family evidently had roots in Haran, but he had been living in Ur of the Chaldeans. They were there for who knows how long, Right? Nobody circumcised up in Haran. Nobody circumcised down here serving these other gods. It wasn't a practice. Abraham was greatly involved in serving those other gods. No circumcision. Married, you know, married a woman who's named after one of those false gods. No, there's no circumcision involved with this guy. Goes up to Haran, lives with the family a little while longer. Nobody's circumcised. They don't, they don't practice that. Comes down through Canaan, historically. The Canaanites don't practice circumcision either. Goes to Egypt. Now, we do have some accounts of Egyptians being circumcised. And other peoples, they weren't the only ones, but we do have some accounts of that. Comes back to, the, to Canaan, and then God says, you know, after 23 years, time to be circumcised. And the only place he's run into this really extensively is in Egypt. Now, that's significant for a couple of reasons. One, it might provide some social understanding for Abraham to think about how to think about circumcision. But also, it's helpful for us because he, it was a, a practice at the time when Abram was down there. Some people were circumcised. Who were they? What, what do we know about it? And I'll just say a few things. The reason I want to minimize or, or just mention this briefly and not spend a lot of time on it and belabor it is because I don't want to take whatever the ancient practice was in Egypt and say, well, that's what the Bible must mean by this because that's not the way it is. I can't just fill in the blanks with, pagan practices and say the same thing applies. But if I find some things among all the different cultures and the way that circumcision was understood, if I find some things in Egypt that really seem to make a lot of sense of the biblical text, I don't want to take that practice and say it's the same thing, but say, look, it functioned maybe in some ways that are similar. And I think we'll see in the whole Bible that it's most similar maybe to Egyptian circumcision in terms of what it meant. Now, before we talk about Egypt briefly, let me say one other thing. In other cultures, circumcision was a rite of passage from childhood into manhood, right? You reach puberty and time to be circumcised. You and all the kids your age who are going through puberty, we're going to line you up and the men of the village are going to get together and this is what we're going to do. 
And that's still practiced that way in a lot of cultures today. This is what, so circumcision is used for all kinds of different things. In Israel, every child on the eighth day, very different than what's done in those other cultures when boys become men, and very different in Egypt as well. Now in Egypt, what was going on? In Egypt, circumcision was a rite performed on one group of people only, priests. Priests. They were the ones who were circumcised. Some other cultures, sometimes just if you were a slave, you could be circumcised. As a mark of your, you know, we, uh, we brand cows, circumcised slaves. Those things were done. But in Egypt, circumcision was done, it was a rite exclusive to priests upon entering service. Not when they were born, when they became an active priest, when, uh, when they invoked upon themselves, when they stepped into their role as priests, and it was now their job to live in the world as a priest of the God they served, they were circumcised. They bore the mark. In this most painful, significant, meaningful of ways, between them and God, or their false God, between them and their God, whoever they meant to serve, they were devoted. It was an act of devotion and consecration. This is what it was. It set them apart for service. Now, this is the same way it's understood by Israel. Right? It's this, they understand it the same way. Not the same act. It's not done at the same time. It's not done only to, to just some of the men. But it is done only to priests, in a sense. All of Israel, they're a nation of priests. Scripture calls them that. Now, it calls us that in a, as Christians in a more real sense. But they were a nation of priests. And you see that in circumcision. You see that borne out. Every boy that was born is circumcised on the eighth day. What else happens on the eighth day? He's redeemed. He's presented before the Lord. You take this eight-day-old child and you take him to the, to the temple. And you pay this, this offering to redeem because he belongs to the Lord. And you buy him there, in a sense. You redeem him for the Lord. In a sense, from the Lord, but also for the Lord. And he's circumcised. He's made a priest. And he's got an obligation, and you've got an obligation to him as a parent, to raise that child up in such a way that he is a priest in a real way, not just bearing the mark. Right? Like the gang member who's got the tattoos, but turned and ratted everybody out. You're no, you're not, you don't belong to this gang. You just have the mark. It's not real. Right? It's this same, this, this represents priesthood. And you, you've got the mark. Now you've got to go live this out. Consider with me Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Verses 2 through 9. Remember, uh, the people of Israel, uh, they were all circumcised before they left Egypt. And then they were out there in the wilderness, and none of their kids had been circumcised. They were kind of on the way. They kind of, I don't know what they thought. Like, well, well, one, they were a faithless generation. That's a big part of it. But two, it's like, I don't know, just, well, we'll wait till we get to the land. We'll, we'll wait and see if God's going to make good on this, and then we'll do it. I don't know what the decision was, why they acted that way. But that's what happens. So now Joshua's at the place. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. <coughs> and it's, you're not getting to go in without this mark of circumcision. Verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua, not, not that these same men are circumcised again. but So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath uh, Haraloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place. God raised them up in the place of the parents that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised 
because they had not been circumcised on the way. Right? Now listen. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from, among, from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. It's like God says, now, you're, now you can serve me. I've rolled away the reproach. Right? I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. What does it mean, the reproach of Egypt? Like, he didn't mean that, like, the Egyptians think badly of you. Like, the reproach of Egypt was, like, in God, the stain of the people, in a sense, left upon the people, all the junk that they picked up in Egypt. The reproach, I've rolled back the reproach of Egypt from among you. It's gone. You now you're ready to follow me. Let's get on with it. Let's get into the land. So, this thing of circumcision, it's an act of consecration that sets you apart for service to God. It's an act of devotion to Him, consecration to Him. It's an intention about your service. I'm going to give my life, the rest of my life, I belong to God, I'm going to serve God, and be God's man in the world. That's what it meant. That's what it was supposed to signify in that sense. Now, Again, this is why Israel can said to be, is said to be a nation of priests and why the refusal to undergo circumcision carried with it the consequence of being cut off from the people. You can't be here in the land among these people serving God's purposes if you're not consecrated to God. You don't even bear the mark of a priest. What are you doing? Get out of here. You don't belong. We're a people devoted to God. That's what circumcision is supposed to mean. Now, one other passage I, I want to turn to, uh, well, two texts, but one, one book. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4 and Jeremiah chapter 9. And then we will move into the New Testament. So Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4. This is the time in Israel's history, among the many times in Israel's history, when they were no longer following God and walking with God but they were still being circumcised, right? And what do we read? Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. They say, we are circumcised. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. You couldn't just have the mark of circumcision and think everything's fine, right? Because what we've been seeing is circumcision, in a sense, was an, an act, a corporate act of the nation to rededicate themselves and their children and their generations after them to be priests to God, to be devoted to Him. And if they keep on that, keep performing that act, but it becomes emptied of its purpose and its intent and of the will to carry it out in the nation, then it's like it's meaningless. And He's saying, you need... You need to circumcise yourself to me. And they say, we are circumcised. We just yesterday, you know, John's boy was circumcised. What are you talking about? Circumcise your hearts. Like, I don't want you to bear the mark of devotion to me on your body, but in your heart. Let's make this thing real. The sign of circumcision was given to a man, Abraham, who was devoted to God, looking to God, trying to serve the Lord, trusting in God's promises, wanting, hoping and trusting that God would bless the nations through his involvement in Abraham's life. He knew this was going to pass. And he's got a child. It's the wrong one, but he's got a child he thinks is evidence of it. God has not abandoned me. And for 13 years he's been plodding along, faithfully believing those things, looking for the next opportunity. What's God going to do next? And God says, here's this sign. I give it, that's my man right there. That's my priest. That's my guy. And here's a nation of people, of that guy's descendants, all saying, we got that sign too. But they don't care about God at all. And God says, look, like it's not just, if you don't have the physical sign of circumcision, you can be cut off, but I'm going to cut you all off right now. Because you, it's in none of your hearts. None of it's real. It's just this physical thing. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. 
And then Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 25. <coughs> Behold, well, let's start in verse 23. I think it gives a better sense of everything here. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. And you might say, Let not the circumcised man boast in his circumcision. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, and the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised. And, the house, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Right, so judgment is coming upon all the nations because they don't, they don't bear the mark of circumcision. They're not concerned with being priests to me. They're not concerned with living before me. But also the nation of Israel, because though they're circumcised in the flesh, their hearts are just like everybody else's. And so judgment's coming to them too. So that, that mark of circumcision that they bore in their body, which was supposed to signify something about this connection they had to God and the way they were related to God in the world and God's promises to them. God said, since circumcision signifies that, any of you who have that will belong to the people, and if you don't, I'll cut you off. But here we see God saying, and that mark of circumcision means nothing. It doesn't separate you apart as my guy if your heart's not circumcised. It means nothing. You'll be judged with everybody else. That circumcision becomes, in a sense to God, uncircumcision. It's useless. What did their circumcision get them? Judgment. Because they were uncircumcised in heart. It has a connection here to the heart. Now, I hope we're well underway to understanding the way Paul talks about this in the New Testament. <clears throat> so let's go back then to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The reason God chose to mark... Now we can say... We can quibble about what circumcision itself, the act, but let's just stop for a second. The reason God gave him a sign at this time was to mark Abraham and his descendants apart as those who were with God in the world. And those who carried with them this promise from God. There's this promise that God had given and was giving here that he was going to, they were going to be a father of nations. The kings would come from him. They would have the land. God would be their God. It says, I will be the, I'll be God to you and I'll be God to them. And he tells Abraham at the beginning, walk before me, I'm, I'm blameless, that I can make this covenant between you and may, me and you and may multiply you greatly. And here's the covenant. I'm going to make you a father of a multitude of nations. How did that happen? How did he become the father of a multitude of nations? Well, physically and spiritually. That walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you. He comes to him um, with some demands about repentance and a more righteous life, but he also comes to him as one who already was God's man in the world. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. You remember, you know, roughly, uh, well, I mean, 20 years before, 20 plus years before, God had revealed to Abraham that he was righteous by faith. Now God says, you're my man. Abraham's grown in faith. <clears throat> 
He's believing God, and God gives him this sign of circumcision to mark off his descendants after him from the rest of the world as given and belonging to God as priests in the world. Now, <coughs> let's go to Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 2. So chapter 2, verse 25, and we'll begin reading. For circumcision, what is, you might say, what's the value of circumcision? We're going to talk, we've talked about the significance of it, what it kind of what it signified. We've talked briefly about the purpose. We'll go back to the purpose here in a minute. But what's the value of it? Verse 25, circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Right? I mean, this covenant sign is great. It's a great sign to have in the world. God gave it to you. It's a gift. It matters. It sets you apart as a priest to God. It means something between you and God if you're keeping the law. But if you just go out and break the law with your life, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So, if a man who is uncircumcised, he doesn't have that mark, but he keeps the precepts of the law, well, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Is God going to say, well, I know you're devoted to me, and I know you're trying to do all the things I say, and I know you're living righteously before me, and you're blameless before me, and you're walking before me, but because you're not circumcised, I don't accept you. No, God's gonna, God accepts that man. That man's in right relationship with God. His uncircumcision is regarded as circumcision. Then, he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law, if that happens, will condemn you who have the written code and you have circumcision, but you break the law. He'll look at you and say, Look at you. You've got all this law that you have, all these things God's given you to do. I would have loved to have had all those Scripture verses. If I had the Scriptures, I would have been so much further along than I am. But you have all that, and you've ignored it, and you've got this mark of circumcision, which is supposed to mark you out for God in the world, and you're not living for God at all. He's gonna, that's what he, he'll condemn you who have the written code and, uncircumcision, but, and circumcision, but break the law. Verse 28. For no one... Why is that true? Why will he do that? For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Circumcision belongs to those whose praise is from God. Right? Now, Circumcision was always intended to be a mark of solidarity with God, a mark of devotion to God, a mark of priesthood in the world. It was, it was outward and physical. Now we have this verse here, it's not outward and physical, but circumcision is in fact outward and physical. Paul doesn't mean there's no outward or physical aspects to circumcision. It's a physical act. What he means is the significance and the purpose and what matters about circumcision, it points to something else. It points to something that's inward and spiritual, right? It was outward and physical, but its purpose was to sign, or its 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 significance was to signify something inward and of the heart. And that's what we see here. Then, verse chapter three, verse one. Then, what advantage has the Jew? I mean, what was the, or what's the value of circum? What is this value of circumcision then? Much in every way. What's the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, or the main, the, the greatest benefit of circumcision, the greatest benefit of being a Jew, of belonging to this group who, to whom was given this covenant of circumcision down through the years, what's the greatest benefit? The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were taught about righteousness. How to be blameless. They were taught from God. They were, they were, to them was entrusted the knowledge of God. That's the greatest benefit. Now, take that text and think about what we have in Genesis 17 here, where God says, I'm going to make this covenant with you. I want you to walk before me and be blameless. And there's a sign of circumcision, and it's going to come. And then, 
<coughs> the next chapter, or said, and I'm going to be God to you, and, you're, and I'm going to be God to your descendants, and everybody's got to keep this covenant. The next chapter, we see God saying, shall I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Seeing that I have chosen him to instruct his children after him in terms of righteousness. Right? So this circumcision set apart Abram and his descendants as a peculiar people in a nation to whom, or, or for the purpose of instructing them in righteousness, teaching them the ways of God. They all bear the mark of priesthood. They're to be living this way. They have this huge emphasis in their culture about living for God. And God eventually makes another covenant with them and gives them a law and gives them all kinds of instruction and gives them the prophets and gives them the writings and gives them all the promises and all these things so that they might know God and know righteousness. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. Huge benefit to them. Huge benefit. That's the value. God was setting a people apart in so many different ways. And circumcision was a massively significant one. Setting them apart as a nation of priests in the world. Now they failed miserably. In the very next verse, what if some were unfaithful? And it's like, it's like an understatement. Some? Like, what do you, don't you mean like, what if almost all were unfaithful? Does almost all of their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Right? God still had a purpose, and He accomplished that purpose. Even if they failed every, all along the way, He still accomplished it. But that doesn't mean the value of circumcision is less. It was still a huge benefit to them if they would personally take advantage of it. This sign of circumcision, when you see that circumcision is a sign of your devotion to God, of your having been by your parents and by your culture, dedicated to the Lord as a priest to Him like they are, you see then how later when those same people are given a covenant, the old covenant, through Moses, with all these laws and rules and regulations, and they all have to keep it. You see then how Paul can later say and testify, he says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, that he's obligated to keep the whole law. Right? If you're going to accept circumcision, what was circumcision? Not just an act of devotion to God, an act of devotion to God and an identification with the Jewish people, the nation who had been given these promises that a physical descendant of theirs would bless the world. If you're going to identify with those people, well, they also have this whole covenant, this other covenant that was given later with all these rules. And all that are circumcised, God will keep all those rules. And Paul's saying, you, can't, you don't get one with the other. If you're identifying through circumcision with Abraham's descendants, then you've got to identify with them completely. You're obligated to keep the whole law. What a thing. It sets the people of Israel apart as a nation of priests, representing God's purpose of blessing the world through a physical descendant of Abraham and setting the world to right one day through him. That's what circumcision means. That was the whole point. Now the purpose in giving this, Romans chapter 4 again, and we'll, this is the last text we'll, we'll look at once more. Romans 4.11, <coughs> halfway through, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. Right, the purpose of Abraham's circumcision and a descending of his, the circumcision of his descendants and all the truth that they were given and the scriptures they were given and all that that came through there was not to result in circumcised people, but was to rather to kind of act as like a, you might think of a, of, a, of a nest or a cocoon or a womb or something for the promises to be held and nurtured and developed and matured until the right time. And when that time would come, then that blessing that God had intended could come out then to everybody, could be enjoyed, both to those who belong to that group, because you'd hate for them to miss it. I mean, you want some of the people that God had chosen specifically to carry these, to be entrusted with this truth, and the prophets came from these people and all this. How could all of them not get it? Some of, they got to be there too. And Paul wrestles with that later in Romans, right? He says, well, there, even though there's so many that are cast off and so many are unbelieving, 
they're still holy because of the, the, uh, the forefathers and the patriarchs, and God has still made some promises, and they will be included. But this blessing wasn't just for them, it's for all the world. It's for all of them. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe. It was a step. You've got to set this people apart. And this was the first step one in God setting a people apart generation after generation to receive his revelation, to receive his truth that one day would result in this blessing coming both to the circumcised and the un uncircumcised. So that Abraham would be the father of a multitude of nations. Because they would be, in the deepest sense, children of Abraham, having the same heart as Abraham has, devoted to him, to, or devoted to God, wanting to, to see this blessing come to more, having learned through hard and difficult struggles what things God requires and what a righteous life looks like. This is, this is Abraham, having been made righteous by faith, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who were not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham, or that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, so that's the purpose. It's the beginning step, the first steps of God setting a nation apart. This is how he did it. He could have done it. He could have told Abraham, you know, like those gangs do, I want a tattoo on your, right above your, your butt over here, you know, or on your back shoulder blade, put it over here, put it on your ankle, put it, I don't know, it's going to be painful, put it between your toes, like, like it could have been anything. He chose circumcision. He chose circumcision. There was nothing fun about Abraham at 99 years old and Ishmael at 13 and all the men in the house. Like it was... In a sense, it was a significant test. Like, think about it. I mean, Abraham, I don't know what kind of life he had in Ur, or what kind of life he had in Haran, but he gets to Canaan, and he's kind of all cast on God, and he's got nothing. But then, through his own lies, he's got all kinds of riches in Egypt, and God kind of made it work out. He didn't really have to suffer for the sins he committed, though he felt deep regret about it and remorse. God's been looking out for him and taking care of him all this time. He's got buddies in some of these, these cities. He could kind of just cozy on up and move in. He's got his child. He loves that kid. And, but if he's going to continue having those things with God's blessing, now he's got to be circumcised. And him and all the... I mean, it's one thing for Abraham to be willing, but what about, you know, Eliezer and his boy? Why do they got to be circumcised? I mean, they're not... Okay, with this, well, he's the master. What, I mean, what does that conversation look like? You're going to be circumcised. No, I'm not. Well, then you're going to, you're going to have to be circumcised. Like, there, you don't have a choice. Be circumcised or else. I mean, I don't know what that looks like. It's a, it's a scary thing. I mean, what, what temptation might Abraham have had, you'd think, to just say, well, I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'll not, I think I'll take what you've given me so far, and I'll walk away. Right? I've got enough. It's enough, Lord. And he kind of, in a sense, does that. Right? No. Ishmael. God says, no. Isaac. Circumcision. That's the way. And that very day, Abraham did it. Carried it out. What a thing. So what's my application in all of this? Well, the one thing I thought we ought to definitely not miss is the way that one, so this circumcision um, was a physical thing that signified something. And like all symbols and signs do, they can have a real tendency to be emptied of their significance. So that you find the nation of Israel later still doing circumcision, but it didn't mean anything anymore, Right? So, aside from just the, the things that we learned, the clarity we got about circumcision today, and taking that into our Bible reading, which will really help us, I also want to say, don't settle for the for a form of godliness, right? 
Like we can do, we can do that in our meetings. Like sometimes we talk this way, we'll say, I kind of feel like we're in a rut. What do we mean by that? What we mean is we're just kind of going through the motions. It doesn't seem really real, right? Don't let that happen in your Bible reading, in your prayer life, your, our time of fellowship together, the meetings, the things that we do. Like we don't want that at all. Like we want our times together to be lively, to be real. And that only happens when our lives are real, right? So don't settle for a form of, don't miss the heart of things. We don't just want things to be done properly in terms of, you know, outwardly what should be done. We want things to be properly because they're from a, the right heart. And so we see this, that there's this huge blessing that was given to the people in this covenant of circumcision. There's a great value there, but it was of no value to those to whom it came because they were uncircumcised in heart, right? We can talk about, I could talk to the kids, we can talk to one another, we can exhort each other about the benefits of gathering together with the Christians, of our meetings together, of doing certain things. But that means nothing to you if you don't avail yourself. There's no heart in that. There's no reality there. We can talk about the benefits and the blessings of having the Word of God, but if it goes unread, it's of no value to you, right? Prayer, oh, God hears prayer. Are you making any? Right? I mean, it's a, we don't want to just know these things and know, well, when I pray, I should do these certain things. Like, we ought to be prayer, prayer for people. And so, this is what we want. We don't want to settle for a form of godliness and denying its power. And that's such an easy thing to do. Right? We don't just want the right knowledge. We want right hearts and right heads, both. Well, are there, are there any appropriate questions? <laughs> any appropriate comments? <laughs> okay. All right. I, I hope that the, at least the significance and the meaning of the covenant of circumcision is sufficiently clear to everyone. Um, all right. Well, let's close in prayer, and we will set up for our meal together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, um, certainly if we're, if we're being honest before you, um, so much of your word um, involving this word and practice of circumcision strikes us as a very strange thing. And yet when we start to understand its significance, we see why it, why it does belong where it's found and why it does, did raise the controversies it did in the New Testament. And all of that, Lord, understanding those things helps us great, more greatly appreciate our own uh, position here in the New Covenant, the sacrifice of Christ for us, the significance of uh, ourselves being made priests to God Most High and all of that. So we're grateful to you uh, for your truth here and your revelation. Thankful that there's enough, that your scripture is sufficient to teach us about these things. We don't have to just guess. Lord, it's our desire that um, all these things would be realities in us in greater and greater ways. Help us to that end. Um, no doubt in the days ahead, and we can look back in our time past as well, that there have been specific things, very hard things you've asked us to undergo in our devotion to you. Not in some ways unlike what Abraham went through. And we pray, Lord, that in those times that come, we pray for great grace upon us that we'd be devoted we wouldn't shrink back and waver that we it could be said of us that very day chad did all that the lord commanded or adam or stan or kayla or elise or any of the rest of us lord we just pray for help in the name of christ we ask all this amen <clears throat>